Welcome to News from Neptune for February 14th in the seventh week of 2020. I'm Carl Estabrook. The socialist Rosa Luxemburg, murdered by a self-proclaimed socialist government in Germany in the aftermath of World War I, said the most revolutionary thing one can do is always to proclaim loudly what is happening. Since 1990, News from Neptune has been a weekly hour of spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media, first on a so-called community radio station and now via Urbana Public TV and YouTube. Earlier editions of this program are available at archive.org. Our mentor Noam Chomsky says in the U.S. media, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. With the help of J.B. Nicholson's research, David Green and I will try to say some true things today on a Trump is not the problem edition of News from Neptune. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> David and I have uh, differed a bit on this point before, but, but uh, it seems well, to me it's today... Gonna, when he cuts off Medicaid to people, he's going to be the problem. Well, when he cuts off Medicare, he's going to be the problem. Uh, when he cuts off Social Security, he's going to be the problem. But, you know, that aside. <laughs> what I have in mind is a column uh, this week by Caitlin Johnstone, uh, who has a way of writing uh, provocative and accurate stuff that upsets uh, a lot of American uh, news commentators. Uh, her column this week is entitled the belief, th the belief that everything will be fine once Trump's gone is more dangerous than Trump. I think she's right about that as we watch the Democrat uh, tergiversations uh, this last week. Uh, John Stone writes, things are not going to be okay once Trump is out of office. Do you know how I know this? Because things weren't okay before Trump got into office. America was a murderous imperialist force whose citizenry was suffering under crushing austerity and steadily mounting authoritarianism on January 19, 2017. And it remains so today, that is the day before. Trump was inaugurated. Certainly the current administration has added its own levels of nefariousness to this dynamic, but the same is true of his predecessors. Uh, and uh, the circumstances uh, of this situation um, are not much, I think, uh, commented on, uh, not by accident uh, in the American media these days. Uh, the political establishment in the United States is playing a uh, uh, wretched game uh, in pretending uh, that Trump is the problem and they have to replace him. Uh, they want to do this for a very real reason. The reason is the American political establishment depends upon uh, foreign, po foreign policy based on neoconservatism and a world economic policy based on neoliberalism, and they are deathly afraid that Trump will live up to his campaign promises uh, criticizing both of, or uh, altering, changing, abandoning uh, both those sets of policies. That's the real basis. It has nothing to do, or very little to do, with the things that uh, the opponents of the current regime say that they're concerned about uh, has a great deal to do about the ongoing policies, uh, the anti-human policies at home and abroad that re recent American governments have all, recent American administrations have all followed, and the fear that Trump, who became president by attacking those policies, uh, even though he's adopted them while he's in office, uh, will change them. Uh, interesting example this morning, uh, in the news, uh, the Associated Press reports, and I'm quoting, a senior U.S. official says the United States and the Taliban have reached a truce agreement that will take effect very soon and could lead to withdrawals of American troops from Afghanistan. Now, that's the Associated Press producing, uh, reporting that. Uh, I'll be interested in knowing who the senior U.S. official is. Uh, there's a very good chance that it's uh, uh, the administration itself, Trump himself, 
uh, speaking on, as they say, deep background. Uh, the point here is that uh, this is what the fight in Washington is really about. Uh, the question is, uh, will Trump, in fact, act on any of the promises uh, that uh, made him president, the promises of opposition to more war and more austerity uh, that have been the, uh, the watchwords of the uh, previous administrations. Uh, what do you think, David? Sure. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been kind of focused on all this nonsense about uh, uh, Chris Matthews feeling that if a socialist had come to power in the 1950s, he would have been killed in, in <laughs> Central Park. Um, I mean, people are saying some outrageous things they about, are. A, about a quasi-socialist man. Um, You're being Bernie I'm, Sanders, I'm right? I'm not as enthusiastic about, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that the so-called pro progressive forces in the Democratic Party primary, uh, you know, the, in, in terms of the people who bother to vote in Democratic Party primaries, uh, are, are not exactly having overwhelming, overwhelming outcomes in terms of uh, the relationship, say, between Sanders and Warren, even if you mistakenly understand that she would be any, any real change in, in our neoliberal capitalism. Um, and the, you know, the, the idea that Bernie is squeaking by with 30 percent of the vote or so uh, as opposed to what she got in New Hampshire four years ago versus Hillary Clinton, 60% uh, or something. Um, I find it a little bit dis, you know, dis, dis, disconcerting. Um, um, there's, uh, Bloomberg is, is really throwing his money around and having his, having his effect on this race and having his effect on all the, all the consultants and all the media who are going to try to persuade people that um, he's possible where Bernie, where Bernie isn't. Um, the, New, the New York Times is throwing itself behind Mayor Pete. Mm. Um, so um, it's not looking, um, even though I want to be positive about Bernie's chances of being a genuine alternative to, and really the only genuine alternative to um, business as, as, as usual in this, in this country, um, I'm not quite seeing the, 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 the head of steam that some other people might, might be seeing, and I'm a little concerned how all this is gonna, gonna play, play out. Uh, I quite agree. I've, I was disturbed this morning to see a poll from Florida. Florida is coming up to a, a, a primary. Um, uh, I think the same day, actually, as the uh, primary here in Illinois. March 17th. Uh, March 17th. Uh, and the poll, uh, and the polls have been, of course, all over the map for good reasons and bad, uh, but the poll of Florida suggests that Bloomberg uh, is leading, uh, and essentially tied with, believe it or not, Joe Biden, both at 26 and 27 percent. Uh, I mean, Florida's weird, I, I realize yeah. that, but uh, still in all, the notion that Bloomberg has bought himself a seat at the table, uh, which certainly seems the case, and that uh, people have not laughed Biden out of the tent yet, uh, suggests that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the state fair continues in Florida in a very peculiar fashion. Uh, Buttigieg is uh, uh, next after the two of those in Florida which I find particularly disturbing. Uh, and Sanders and Buttigieg are essentially tied at 10% uh, in Florida. Now, this is, not, uh, this is not domination by Sanders by any means. Uh, and for all the peculiarities of Florida, yeah. it's disturbing about where the uh, uh, media circus has got the, uh, the, 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 uh, pri the primary to go. So I was reminded when I was engaged in a tutorial session yesterday with some seventh graders at Jefferson Middle School, I was reminded of the difference between independent probability and dependent pro probability. Inde independent probability is like when you roll, roll a dice, when you roll dice, and every time it's the same odds that one over, one over you know, one out of six is going to come up. Dependent probability is like when you 
draw balls out of a out of a out of a hat, and then you go back in, and your probability changes according to which balls, whether you drew the white balls or black balls. Okay, so all of this is a way of saying <laughs> that that the probabilities in Florida will depend on what happens or dependent there they will depend on what happens in in the states between them namely Nevada and South Carolina um, and who stays in the race who drops out um, and um, as well as uh, other other factors that might intervene in the you know the meantime so all people can do I think and I'm being I'm being optimistic as I have been on previous programs that uh, Bernie Sanders is worth is worth supporting is worth advocating for is worth seeing as a, a genuine opportunity for a a slut for a a uh, for the prospect of genuinely egalitarian reform in this country including even a better foreign policy even a better foreign policy towards Israel and Palestine, although St Stephen Salida d doesn't agree with with me on you know on that on that account, and I kind of understand where he's coming from, but I, I don't agree with him. Um, so there you go. I was just going to ask you about that, Stephen Salida. Of course, he was uh, uh, fired from uh, this uh, the little university down the street here um, because of saying the wrong things about Israel, uh, and uh, now has written a column for the for Counterpunch. Uh, well, for other publications, well, it, but it, it appears, appears on his own, yeah, exactly. his own blog first of all. It, it yeah. appears in Counterpunch where he mm -hmm. suggests that. Uh, 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 Sanders' reputation for being the best of the Democratic con uh, 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 candidates uh, in regard to Israel is overblown, and that does not uh, really suggest there's much difference between uh, Sanders' position on Israel and that of the other Democratic candidates. Um, um, is he right? Um, in regard to maybe, Sanders, maybe, uh -huh. but I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm not persuaded. I'm not persuaded not to have a measured enthusiasm, a yeah. measured and sincere enthusiasm about Sanders. I'm not persuaded, uh, Stephen, I like Stephen, and he says a lot of things that other people don't say, especially about what goes on on co college campuses. He punctures a lot of mythology about higher ed and about political correctness in higher ed, about multiculturalism, about stuff like that. Um, but. Um, when it comes to Israel-Palestine, um, he, you know, you can contrast his views to that of someone who I tend to, to see as sort of a, a northern star in that regard, and that would be Nor Norman Finkelstein, and um, and the the you know, divisions there have been pretty basic for a long time regarding one state versus two state, about the realism of promoting the right of return for Palestinian refugees, um, a, a variety of things that. Stephen clings to, and again, understandably, as a person of Palestinian background, but um, you know, Finkelstein has been continued to be fairly um, stalwart in his promotion of international law and possible solutions through international law. Um, of course, none of this plays itself out in relation to either either Obama or Trump or anybody b before before them. Um, but I would. Con continue, if I'm reading Norman Finkelstein's views right, I would continue to feel that any president that simply wanted to lay down the law, so to speak, could effect a just two-state two state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict and um, in, 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 a, in, a fairly, in a fairly clear way. And I don't see I mean, BDS, BDS, BDS. It's been 15 years now, BDS. Um, everybody's still talking about it. Mondo Weiss has all about it all the time. All the energy put into that, I support it, but it hasn't gotten us anywhere. One of the things that is most shocking, I must, I must say, is the um, uh, effectiveness 
of Israel in uh, producing uh, anti-boycott uh, laws, quite literally, in the United anti-boycott of Israel mm -hmm. laws within the United States. Uh, the uh, most recent example, probably not the most recent example, a recent example of that um, is the uh, uh, lawsuit uh, by a well-known uh, political uh, commentator uh, against the state of Georgia. Uh, who refused to let her speak on the Georgia University campus uh, unless she signed an anti-boycott pledge. Um, this is a result of a state law passed by the Georgia legislature. Yeah. Uh, this is this is outrageous. Mm -hmm. This is incredible and the most uh, severe uh, inf interferences with uh, free speech that uh, that I've seen in a while uh, in the US yeah. um, it's uh, uh, we know we have a similar example here in the state of Illinois uh, the last governor of Illinois signed a law about uh, uh, boycott uh, about uh, not, not using state monies uh, to invest in companies uh, that observed uh, a boycott against Israel for its outrages in the uh, occupied territories. That's incredible. And it's all uh, sort of uh, flown under the radar, radar, I suppose literally in some senses, but uh, figuratively in the sense that it's not much discussed. But there's a law in Georgia, there's a law in a dozen other states to the same effect. Yeah. And, you know, it, and it, this is referred to as lawfare. Uh, you know, warfare, lawfare, right? And um, it's it's. I, mean, I guess what's discouraging to me, after being involved in these issues for 22, 23 years now, is that we've become the younger people, especially, and become a fairly highly educated a, po a population about the the base the basic injustices that are being meted out to the Palestinian people in a way that couldn't have have been have been you know, imagined um, 15 or 20 years ago before this kind of education campaign started and before the anti-war movement such as it is more or less incorporated a concern with justice in Israel and Palestine to the broader anti-war movement and all the people like Medea Benjamin and so on and so forth have, have, gone, have gone forward with that. So people understand now that, you know, the Palestinians aren't just a bunch a bunch of terrorists, and that and that and that Israel isn't isn't just a bunch of innocent hol Holocaust you know, survivors. Um, they can see how awful Netanyahu is. They can see the people who su support supported Obama could see how awful he was he was treated. But um, the the calculus of U.S. foreign policy in relation to all that just hasn't really meaning, meaningfully changed. Uh, one thing that has changed is that th over those years is that the, the rise of the Christian right as the sort of the Christian Zionist right as supporting as the, the pro one of the primary supporters of, of you know, Israel in terms of their, of their funding and their support for, for po uh, politicians um, has has more or less, you know, replaced uh, that of perhaps more liberal Jews who would rather not not talk about 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 you know Israel as much as they they used to and and aren't necessarily as comfortable as as uh, uh, going to APAC as 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 they once were. So, um, but the calculus of U.S. foreign policy hasn't changed, and that's because it's. It's so ensconced in all of the broader issues that we, in the terms of the, the Middle East and globally, ge geopolitically, as we talk about every week on this program. The support in, uh, amongst American Christians, of course, for Zionism is centered in the evangelical tradition in this country, uh, and uh, that is significant, uh, but it's uh, also worth uh, uh, talking about uh, and uh, in a way that uh, um, takes uh, seriously the concerns of ev evangelical Christians and pointing out where they're wrong. 
uh, and uh, that's that that's a discussion we should have uh, rather than the uh, uh, avoidance of such discussions on the grounds of uh, ah that's a religious question. It, it's also worth noting that there's been much about as the Syria conflict has played out for the last nine years or so. There's been much about the Syria conflict in relationship to the manner in which it's been covered and the way people have lined up around um, Assadism versus anti-Assadism yeah. and so on and so forth that has kind of served to to puncture the 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 salience of the of the pro-Palestine movement. It's also true that the, the Palestinians themselves, that the the ruling class of the, the Palestinian Authority has uh, gotten comfortable and you know can live pretty well from one day to the the, you know, the next uh, on the on their their sort of you know NGO salaries and so forth and their their you know their aid so there isn't uh, a, an extraordinary amount of restiveness from what I can understand going on um, and and uh, you know beyond that. Um, I've noted for a long time that the the turn towards identity politics had go, goes way back, but especially when Obama was elected president, became president in 2009, the, and subsequent to that, the I've noticed that the Students for Justice in Palestine movement generally on college campuses and the Jewish Voice for Peace movement, which I'm sort of a part of, has uh, been, I, I think, kind of neutered in its in its passion for a a good materialist Marxist anti-war understanding of what's going on in Israel and Palestine. Um, it's been too concerned with allies as opposed to a, a solidarity, as as the current language goes. It's been it's been too concerned with. Uh, just being one of those intersectional pieces that advocates for the rights of certain groups on an I identitarian basis. And so the Palestinians has, have become one, one, of, one, of those, one of those identities. And I think that, you know, as, as you, know, you, see some, you see some movement, um, but <clears throat> when I... When I, I read a transcript of a segment uh, of a, a full show segment of Amy Goodman a, f a few days ago in which the squad was being interviewed by her her colleague Nermeen Sheikh and um, I must say I, d I didn't hear a lot to really in 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 inspire me in a particularly concrete way what I heard was a, l a lot of a lot of a lot of promotion of the idea that they were outsiders and now now they're insiders and they represent they represent the voiceless but they have power now no. they all of these women got into congress i couldn't get into congress you couldn't get That's into right. congress <laughs> even though we tried <laughs> i mean i'm you know i'm glad i'm I'm glad I didn't, to be honest with you, but I'm, I won't say I'm glad you didn't. Well, I won't <laughs> say I'm glad you didn't either. Right? We, we would have done better than the current crowd. Well, yeah, but, but the, the, the point is, when are they going to stop talking about how, you know, when are they going to start saying what it is they want to see done? And that what was largely missing from this, from this kind of confab as it is missing from the general uh, uh, democratic attempt to find a candidate, too. I mean, this is being conducted at a, uh, a level of, uh, uh, of convention and abstraction uh, that uh, uh, is qu quite shocking given the, re given the real problems facing the country and, much more importantly, what this country, what the government of this country is doing around the world. Um, I, peculiar things turn up. Uh, recently because of the control of the discussion uh, in the uh, presidential campaign. Uh, one of these things is that um, Fox News, Fox News, yes, Fox News, uh, and particularly the Tucker Carlson program on that, uh, uh, on, on Fox News, uh, is, is airing things that can't be said elsewhere. Uh, one recent example uh, is the uh, clips from the Jimmy Dore show 
that uh, are turning up on Tucker Carlson, supposedly this right-wing uh, libertarian uh, commentator on Fox News. Uh, Jimmy Dore uh, is a left-wing commentator and a very good one. Uh, we'd play his clips here if he weren't uh, uh, subjected to a uh, racial discrimination in that his use of the Anglo-Saxon language uh, is not permitted on uh, the uh, on American media, and for that reason we can't re we can't air the clips. Um, the uh, uh, recent a recent clip from Door showed the a crowd chanting Wall Street Peace. Well, sorry, let's try that again. Wall Street Pete to and booze at a Buttigieg rally. Uh, as uh, the candidate spoke. Uh, this is the sort of thing that's not being said uh, in the media about the uh, Buttigieg campaign. Uh, the fact that Buttigieg is uh, a CIA man uh, and a Wall Street man, and that's what he represents as a, a, a presidential candidate, uh, is reported by Jimmy Dore, but it's not reported elsewhere. Uh, and uh, it's the sort of thing that we need, uh, the vast silence about the interest being backed by American Democratic candidates uh, needs to be exposed. Um, the uh, uh, use, by the way, of social media in this regard uh, also uh, should be deplored. Facebook is in cahoots with CNN and the Buttigieg campaign. Uh, in that uh, they are, uh, Jimmy Dewar's uh, uh, Facebook po post showing how the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, was flipping votes to favor Buttigieg. Uh, uh, and um, when this was, when Dewar reported that, Facebook said, uh, you can't do that. Uh, the warning that Facebook put up was, uh, on Jimmy Dewar's uh, program, was, quote, quote, was, quote, false information in this post. Facebook is deciding what false information is. Independent fact checkers at Lead Stories, capital L, capital S, say this post has false information. That's the post about Buttigieg from Jimmy Dore. To help stop the spread of false news, a notice will be added to your post if you decide to share this. The options are post anyway, see fact check, and cancel. Lead Stories is the firm where one of the so-called staff writer and fact checkers works, specifically Ryan Cooper, who was also the former director of programming at, wait for it, CNN International, quote, where he helped shape the network's daily newscast broadcast to more than 280 million households around the world. That's what Facebook says. In other words, Facebook is incorporating uh, into its uh, censorship uh, the work of the same uh, cable networks that are controlling the discussion of the U.S. presidential campaign. Uh, the supposedly open uh, social media uh, are uh, themselves being censored in a uh, shocking fashion and therefore we shouldn't be surprised that people know far less about what's going on in American politics uh, that one can, than one can glean by reading the foreign press and uh, other aspects of those uh, nasty Russians, for example, who are threatening to manipulate our, uh, our, our political arrangement. Our political arrangements are manipulated enough, thank you, by uh, American interests, uh, American corporate interests, and uh, they know how to do it. Would you, I mean, you've watched more Tucker Carlson than, than I have, I'm quite sure. Um, in fact, I haven't really watched any Tucker Carlson except the clips I, that I see with people I happen to know or with the, the Jimmy Dore business or when Nina Paley was on there or whenever. But my understanding from some of the, some of the things that I listen to or read is that Tucker Carlson is a sort of a social con con conservative. I mean, I mean, I don't know. You say libertarian, right. yes, and maybe I don't. I don't see him. I have. A, I you know, suspect that he's not a, a libertarian in the Milton Friedman, um, Koch brothers sense, or even in the free trade, quote unquote, free trade sense. I mean, I, 
I, I mean, I'd be interested to know what what you think about this. He he seemed to he seems to to represent people who understand that their 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 communities have been ad, adverse adversely affected by neoliberal policies. Yes, and that doesn't make him libertarian in That's my true. in my book. That's true. It makes him communitarian, perhaps in some broad sense of the word, and someone who's concerned as conservatives in sort of a good sense of that word are concerned about the social bonds that people have with each other that are frayed by the economic vicissitudes of neoliberal policies. I think the um, uh, at the heart of his politics uh, is a an opposition to the identity politics that has uh, come to characterize the left ever since and the uh, generation and more that the left has given up uh, the American left has given up to see given up seeing exploitation yeah. as the problem with American society and substituted the notion of discrimination uh -huh. uh, he is appalled at the uh, uh, American politics uh, that uh, conditions every question in terms of racism uh, and uh, that, for example, leads him to support the administration's uh, uh, opposition to immigration uh, and even support perhaps Trump's wall uh, on the grounds that uh, uh, the uh, influx into the United States needs to be controlled, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. this is uh, uh, something that the government must do. And as I've been saying on many previous programs, I've been promoting the podcast What's Left with a couple of young people named Benjamin Studebaker and Amy, Amy, Amy Therese, and they did a program. Uh, it's possible it's behind a paywall, I'm not sure, but um, if you but, it, but you know, in, in, in any in any event, they did a a very good show, as all their shows are, um, in response to a book that the the Jacobin podcaster uh, Daniel Denver, who does a, a sort of Jacobin sponsored podcast podcast called the you know, the Dig. Daniel Denver has a book about it. He's promoting the idea of open borders. And he's promoting it from a, sort of a, a left socialist point of view. And the What's Left podcasters have been relentless in their criticism of Daniel Denver and his ilk in thinking that uh, open borders is going to solve anything and thinking that we can base a politics, a successful politics, say, on behalf of Bernie Sanders, and the left, the What's Left podcasters very much support Bernie Sanders, they are, they are harshly critical of Daniel Denver's, what they consider very scattered and dis, 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 disingenuous pr you know, promotion of of open open borders, in terms of of economic policy or political uh, or, or political or as a political program that will that will you know appeal to people um, wanting to vote who we need to vote for Bernie Sanders. Uh, perhaps there needs to be a good deal more discussion on this. I mean mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the open borders question. It's being used in various ways, I think, on various sides uh, in the discussion. Uh, but uh, it does seem to suggest that uh, the promise and the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, so forth and so on, uh, uh, has to be put aside for some reasons that are important somewhere. I have trouble seeing that. The whole notion that the uh, uh, open borders promise uh, is something that the American society should should support seems to me right. Uh, 
First of all, a lot of the refugees we're talking about are refugees from uh, vast crimes that the U.S. is responsible for, whether we talk about Syria or Latin America. Uh, and uh, the notion that the refugee problem uh, is something that uh, America indeed has a responsibility to deal with seems to me to be right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it raises other questions about the sort of social supports, uh, including health care and uh, uh, the Andrew Yang's uh, uh, universal basic income and so forth that we should be talking about as well. And to say, well, the problem is immigration, the problem is poor people and so forth coming from other countries, the problem is criminals coming across our borders, the sort of thing the administration wants to say, uh, that seems to me to be quite wrong and should be opposed. Where do you see an argument in the, favor the of the immigration? Uh, the immigration policies of this country for the last 50 years, like every other aspect of social policy for the last 15 years, have mo moved us toward this neoliberal moment, toward this, this increasing economic in, in inequality, toward this brutality, through, through the desiccation or the, or the, uh, the, um, the, po the sort of policies that have destroyed rural areas that have been that have, that have um, abandoned you know industrial towns that have, that have you know, impoverished inner cities that have gentrified certain aspects of inner of of urban areas and in, in blue states and. Meanwhile, mean, meanwhile, impoverishing um, vast segments of this of this country, dividing into this this country into a few places that are doing quite well, even though they're too expensive for ordinary people to live in, as opposed to those pla places that are not doing quite well, and even the people in those places that are doing somewhat well because they're able to hang on to their jobs in education and health care and service industries of various kinds. Um, given, given all of that, the, you know, the, the, to, to see, to see Im you know, immigration policy as a you know, solution to those neoliberal policies without considering how we deal with the, ne with the wreckage of ne neoliberalism in this country is basically basically asking people in red states or in hurting communities not to vote for Bernie Sanders. So when Ber Bernie Sanders has, you know, is is put it, put in the you know the you know position of being asked to support open borders, which he doesn't, and then is and then is is questioned in terms of his commitment to social justice on that basis. That is basically asking the Bernie Sanders movement to to undermine itself, yes. to you know, to fail. I think that's true. So, um, I you know, I I just I I believe that we have to understand what what this. There's obviously been a very liberal you know immigration policy for the past 50 years. L look look around you. Um, we have people from all over the world. We have a very different population. That's fine. People are here. They should stay here. Um, they should be treated. They should be treated well. They should be given the services that everybody, that that neither them nor people, other, you know, citizens who who need them, they should be given. They should be given services in a very different political and social context. But that it shouldn't be seen the the whole the whole the whole you know the, the whole issue of whether more people should come shouldn't be seen apart from radical changes in both foreign and you know, domestic policy. Uh, or in the sense that uh, uh, a liberal policy on immigration uh, requires. Uh, those changes, radical changes that you're talking about. Yes, I think that's it, right. It doesn't require it if you're the, the you know, the Koch brothers. Well, they're they're happy to have well, to have poor people come and wor work for nothing and and continue to support their neoliberal policies, their environmentally destructive policies, et cetera, et cetera. 
the other way to put it is to say that immigration poses the questions that we have to deal with regarding uh, support, medical care, uh, homelessness, and, uh, and, and, and work as well. These are the things that a, uh, that a uh, more nearly just society needs to provide, and we have to begin to provide them rather than keeping out people who will need these services. Uh, the uh, notion that, that con controlling that uh, immigration is the way not to face those problems uh, seems to me to be quite wrong. Uh, the last administration, the Obama administration, uh, in fact had a, uh, a, a very bad record on allowing immigration into this country. Yeah. Deporter in chief, uh, Obama was called at, at, at several points, uh, on the uh, uh, remarkable ability of the Obama administration to deny immigration. Uh, the only difference, but or the major difference between the Obama administration and the Trump administration in this regard is the Trump administration does it out loud and considers it uh, a, a good thing. The Obama administration did it typically uh, uh, by misdirection and not admitting what in fact it was doing because it violated the supposedly liberal principles of the Obama administration. Uh, they were just, the Obama administration was just as bad uh, at uh, uh, limiting immigration as the Trump <coughs> administration, if not worse. All I'm saying, <laughs> that's all well and good. All I'm saying is that, and I'm, I'm reflecting what I've, what I've listened to in this criticism of Dan Denver in his, in his new book, is that um, the people in the, pardon me for using these cliches, but the people in the heartland of this country or the rural areas, or the the small you know industrial communities that have seen better days. Just look at Danville, Decatur, Peoria, Rockford, whatever, or or you know Iowa, or or whatever. These people don't need to be told that they they need to be more tolerant towards towards you know that their problem is they're just racist. They're just yep. white. They're just white MAGA hat wearing racists voting for Donald Trump. Uh, these people who need to be convinced that that Bernie Sanders has a better program for them than Donald Trump um, need to have need to need to have it made clear to them that uh, that Bernie Sanders doesn't think they're racist because be, just because they think that having they may not think and they they rightfully may not think just that having more Im immigrant populations come to their their you know their com you know communities with whatever economic vitality they might bring in various ways is any kind of fundamental you know, solution to their to their you know economic problems it just isn't the case this country needs a program for those it needs it needs ma massive in you know, investment programs and sort of, you know, re, re, re industrialization or Green New Deal type programs or, you know, investments in education and healthcare and so forth in those places that have been allowed to die because of sort of corporate driven social policies. What that means is that we need social policies that support people. Uh, and that's why the universal basic income looks, uh, looks, looks good. And we need policies that give people the things that they need. Uh, Health care at the top of the list, as the Sanders campaign makes very clear. But they needn't stop there. Uh, everyone admits there's a terrible problem of homelessness uh, in major American cities. Uh, the solution to that problem is giving people homes. The solution to that problem is not limiting immigration. The solution to that problem is not uh, uh, urging people to go out and look for a job. The solution to that problem is to provide homes for the homeless. Uh, we have a serious problem uh, of poverty in this country, uh, uh, a poverty that uh, uh, has not changed with the supposed expansion of the American economy. Uh, in the last generation, uh, and what poor people need is money. 
Uh, we need supports for the people who are in the country right now and the people who might join them. And the only way to do that is to spend government money. Uh, and the only way to do that is to make sure that these, uh, polit these policies are instituted by the government rather than uh, uh, avoided uh, on the grounds that uh, dangerous people are coming across the border. Uh, so it's not certainly not what the Trump administration is doing, but it's not what uh, you know, the, uh, any other major figures within the American political system, including Bernie Sanders, are saying either. Uh, these are things that have to be done, and for all the advances that a Sanders administration would represent, uh, there are many more things that need <coughs> to be demanded of that. The notion that we can't afford it is nonsense. Uh, look at the military budget that was just passed and figure out how that money could be used for other things. Uh, we don't even have to go into the point that you've made frequently before that uh, a better understanding of uh, monetary theory may suggest that a different approach is uh, uh, mm -hmm. not all that hard, so to speak. Yeah. Well, you know, the, what's, what's aligned with the modern monetary theory, and which I partially subscribe to, is, is that is that uh, people need jobs and yep. people? We need an infrastructure program. We need a, exactly. we need massive de you know, development programs, hopefully, towards the pursuit of environmental goals, um, as well as you know, go. I mean, related to transportation, communication, and and all all that stuff. And we need the home building. And there's 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 plenty of work wor work to be done. And as long as we depend on the private sector. Be, oh, oh, that old, as long as we depend on that work getting done, only if the private sector can can profit from it, um, then the, then the work's not going to be done. Then um, we're just going to end up with the, uh, the the more desperate areas of this country even more more desperate, and um, uh, that's you know that's not the way to go. <laughs> um. I'm not uh, a fan, uh, as I've mentioned before, of Pete Buttigieg. Uh, in fact, I've gone so far as to, as to say that if the Democrats actually nominate Buttigieg, uh, I will not follow my usual practice of voting for the Green Party. I'd actually vote for Trump against Buttigieg if it comes to that. Now, I, that's, that's the stuff of nightmares, and uh, I don't want to have to think about that, but I do want to suggest that uh, Buttigieg, the candidate of the CIA and Wall Street, is a seriously dangerous man. And uh, uh, I think we should do a great deal to try to uh, eliminate a Buttigieg uh, administration. Um, nevertheless, he does have one good suggestion, uh, or he seems to. Uh, he suggested that, that uh, the war on drugs should not only be liquidated, uh, but that um, uh, dr drugs, all drugs, uh, should be decriminalized. Now, decriminalization is not the same thing as legalization. It would still be illegal to produce meth for sale, for example, uh, or even heroin. But the notion that uh, people should be uh, uh, penalized uh, for uh, using these drugs uh, is uh, a mistake. And uh, I think the Buttigieg, for whatever reason, has said so. That's good. Good, f good for Mayor Pete. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not going to hear that often from us, Score I don't one think. for Mayor Pete. Yes. I really have heard very little. I mean, I, I don't really watch the political rallies or the, the you know, debates. I, I, so I, I, really, I really hear... I, I need to I need to hone in on just listen to a speech that this guy gives, and I'm I'm quite kind of kind of interested in what his style is and how he you know present presents himself. But um, I just really haven't gotten gotten around to you know to doing that yet. So um, any, anyway, I'm just sticking with Bernie. We began <laughs> we began the program today by talking about this peculiar announcement from the administration. Uh -huh. uh, that a some sort of ceasefire with the Taliban in Afghanistan uh, will occur, quote, very soon, close quote. That's the Associated Press's uh, account. Um, the uh, 
uh, background to this uh, was uh, last December's or last month's uh, last December's uh, publication in the Washington Post uh, of what we came to be called the Afghan War Papers, an account uh, that has been compared to the Pentagon Papers in regard to Vietnam of the uh, uh, growth and genesis of America's longest war, uh, the war in Afghanistan. Uh, those papers pointed out we were, sp we were still uh, and continuously spending a billion dollars per month on the war in Afghanistan uh, and that the war had been started for reasons, and I'm quoting now the Afghan papers, that U.S. military commanders struggled to articulate who they were fighting, let alone why. Uh, now the Washington Post tells us of a cryptography company a company called Crypto AG, which appears to be a profitable Swiss firm which, quote, made millions of dollars selling equipment to more than 120 countries well into the 21st century. Uh, in other words, they've been doing for a good while. Uh, its clients included Iran, military juntas in Latin America, nuclear rivals India and Pakistan, and even the Vatican. That's interesting about the Vatican's um, uh, need for cryptography. I mean, it makes some sense, but still. What none of its customers ever knew was that Crypto AG, this is the crypto, this is the firm uh, based in Switzerland, was secretly owned by the CIA in a highly classified partnership with West German intelligence. These spy agencies rigged the company's devices so they could easily break the codes that countries used to send encrypted messages. That is, the whole world's, the, effect, the effective world's uh, government con conversation uh, was available uh, to uh, the CIA and its friends in Europe uh, on the basis of their uh, hacking of these machines which were being sold for private communications amongst governments. Uh, there is a documentary on Swiss television about this. It's hard to get, apparent, according to our researcher in this country. It might, uh, we'll have more information about that, about whether we can get this documentary. Uh, but uh, the point is that the uh, politics of the war in uh, Afghanistan has always been a CIA war. Uh, back to the Carter administration, which eventually st uh, started it, and uh, from this most recent revolution, <laughs> revelation, uh, uh, seems to control it uh, as it is now. So uh, once again, we understand why it is that the American political establishment, which very much includes the intelligence community, is so opposed to Donald Trump. Donald Trump said that he wanted to liquidate the war in Afghanistan. Uh, he said he wanted to liquidate the war in Syria. This is the raison d'etre of the CIA. Uh, they do things like that for the uh, American 1%. Uh, uh, and anyone who says, for whatever reasons, misguided or, 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 or guided, if you like, um, uh, that they're going to liquidate those wars are flying in the face of the uh, uh, purposes of the CIA. Uh, this is the conflict between Trump and the deep state that is talked about in various ways, uh, but never, it seems to me, quite adequately set out as to what's going on here. It's not a case of good guys versus bad guys. It's a question of various political developments within the American empire, uh, developments that should be clearly described so they can be clearly opposed. Uh, that's the sort of thing that we need to do. But I guess these people in the deep state don't have a problem with Trump who wants to decimate social programs and cut people's Medicare, Medicaid, uh, dis destroy the env environment. I mean, they don't have a problem with that. Um, and Trump can go ahead and do all that he wants. Sure. And um, But that's been true of the CIA from the beginning, right? Yeah, well, yeah, but the point is let's not... <laughs> Let's not deny who Trump is and what he's up to. 
No, and but it's, it, worth, it's worthwhile to give a good account of what, what is actually happening in American politics and why, as we uh, uh, said at the beginning of the program today, uh, that the elimination of Trump one way or another uh, will not produce felicity. Well, do you think that, that, you think that they're going to like Sanders more than they like Trump? I mean, if the Democrats nominate I Sanders. I hope not. Don't you think these? Don't you think these people are all going to are, are all of a sudden going to discover all kinds of things that they actually like about Trump, including the fact that basically, uh, you know, as phlegmatic as he is or as unpredictable as he is, he'll he'll basically go along with what the general program is, where there's whereas they see a chance that Bernie Sanders might not go along with what I the think general that's true. program. Is. I think that's quite right. I think that's quite right, and. Uh, it's uh, important to see that uh, the uh, um, uh, Trump and Sanders campaign both represent uh, the insurgency against American uh, political control by the one percent uh, uh, that needs to be handled, uh, both of which needs to be handled by the one percent and its agents. That's the real politics, the deep politics, if you like, of America these days, and the sort of reason that uh, um, we get the uh, uh, remarkable opposition uh, to um, uh, the Sanders campaign uh, that begins to look a lot like the opposition to Trump. Uh, they are, uh, pr the same principles are at stake in both of them, that is, yeah. the uh, a challenge to the uh, um, uh, to the rule of the American 1%. Well, yeah, the, the, the main difference being that the Sanders insurgency is a real insurgency, whereas the Trump insurgency is, is just fake. And they're, they're, they, you know, they, they just haven't had any trouble. I mean, given his, his cap cabinet appointments and given his general foreign policies, given his attitude towards Venezuela, you know, Israel, Palestine, um, et you cetera, there, there just hasn't been uh, much opportunity for anyone to really dig their teeth into anything that they, they can see that, uh, that Trump might offer in terms of an, act, an actual departure. Uh, that's why the announcement of uh, a ceasefire in Afghanistan uh, is so important because that is an example of the sort of opposition to the one percent's politics, uh, the one uh, the political establishment's politics uh, that the Trump administration has threatened since the uh, since the 2016 campaign, but, but is rarely but, rarely but does it, does activated. It, does it indicate even a modest sea change in the nature of geopolitics? It does certainly it, makes a sea change. Indicate, does if, it indicate that there's that this whole globalization thing and this whole you know Russia China thing that he's at all at all concerned with, you know, uh, changing, changing the nature of the, the manner in which the United States attempts to, attempts to control the way the gl global, global economy work, works, or that, the, that he's going to challenge the manner in which, in which American corporations seek to dominate the, the glo glo global economy and, and dictate the terms of the way things work in this world. The withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan and Syria would certainly be steps in the right direction. Well, <laughs> teeny tiny little steps, if if that. Well, not, not, so not so teeny tiny if it means the uh, well, ending of, of uh, Americans killing people and being I mean, killed in yeah, Afghanistan. Well, we've still got the 800 bases, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I wouldn't put aside the importance of an American withdrawal uh, from Syria and Afghanistan. That's the reason that Trump is so bitterly opposed by the American political establishment. Uh, we'll see if indeed he can make his writ run. Okay. You have been watching News from Neptune for February 14th, a Trump is not the problem edition. And there are clearly more to talk about in that regard. See the further notes on the Facebook page for News for Neptune from our chief researcher, the mysterious J.B. Nicholson. News for Neptune is presented by Carl Estabrook, David Green, and J.B. Nicholson. It's produced and directed by Jason Liggett and Kevin Lau. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune to remind you, in the words of Edward de Vere in The Tempest, what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies 
and a good night to you.